I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. We're continuing in our studies this dispensational section of the book of Romans that begins in chapter 9 and runs through chapter 11. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises whose are the fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. Now we're working down through this list because as we said, when Paul is writing this letter to the Roman church, he hadn't been there personally. And the Roman church are converts, Gentile and probably some Jewish converts there. We know Aquila and Priscilla are up there teaching them. And, but when, when we see Romans as the flagship, if you would, the first book in Paul's epistles, we know that there's some doctrine that's being laid down according to the establishment of a believer, the way Paul would personally teach if he were there in the flesh. So he writes to them in the order, and it's interesting that we have a written form of the doctrine the way Paul would teach it to establish a new believer uh, who has trusted the gospel. And you have the first several chapters, the first five chapters at least you can say, chapters three, four, and five are focused primarily on explaining what justification by faith means, what, how it is God makes you righteous by trusting that Christ died to pay for your sins, how it is has God, a holy and righteous God, just to justify you on the basis of faith alone. And we have the first, those chapters explain that in Romans. Then the following three chapters, chapters 6, 7, and 8, you have a, an explanation now that you're saved by grace through faith alone. How do you walk? And you are, you are taught in those three chapters that the walk of the believer, or sanctification, the service of a believer, is by grace through faith alone in the new identity God has made you in Christ. And you learn about what it is God's made you in Christ, who and what God's made you, and you walk by faith in that identity. That's who you are. God says that's who you now are in that he's regenerated your spiritual nature. He indwells your spiritual nature. He's baptized you into Christ and sealed you there. And you can learn in those chap chapters how it is that as a believer that's, that has all their sins forgiven, that has the assurance of your salvation, you're complete in Christ, you're sealed in Christ, how that should make a difference in your life and your walk as a believer. But here, chapter 9, beginning in chapter 9, there's a, a dispensational section put in that Paul explains why God is just to temporarily set the nation of Israel and their program, the prophetic program, interrupt that temporarily in order to accomplish this purpose with the church, the body of Christ. So he's explaining that, and in the process of explaining that to a bunch of Gentiles who are not familiar with God's Old Testament, what he does is he explains what Israel's program was about. They need to be taught Israel's program, and so he does that in chapters 9, 10, and 11, and he starts out by saying, these are some blessings that Israel had that I've already told you that on some of them that you now have as members of the body of Christ is that as the uh, sons of God, as the adopted children of God, these promises that you have as an inheritance to look forward to in chapters 5, 6, 7, okay, chapters, I'm sorry, 3, 4, and 5, especially. And he says, but you need to know that God had made these similar promises to the nation of Israel. They had these promises first. And I want you to see that here in, in verse 4. He says, there are my kinsmen in the flesh, verse 3, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption. Now, the adoption in the Bible, according to Schofield, the Schofield Reference Bible, adoption in the Greek word means the placing as a son. And he says adoption is not so much a word of relationship as it is a word of position. So what he's saying is what we know about adoption from studying adoption in Romans chapter 8, 
that it, in the Bible, it's a reference to a, a, an adult son receiving the inheritance from the father. It's, the adoption doesn't mean relationship. A, a child becomes, a, you know, that doesn't have a family is adopted into that family and becomes a relationship as a son to the, fa to the father. What it means is the position. This son who was a son is given this position at the, as heir to the estate of the father. This adult position, equal, joint heirs, if you will, with the father. That's what adoption is about. Now, there are a lot of references in the Bible to something like that happening. Uh, the one you, should, you probably think of is in Luke 15 with the prodigal son, right? You have the two sons, and the one son comes to the father and says, <clears throat> Father, give me, my, give me my inheritance, basically. I, I want to strike out on my own. So he gets a share of his inheritance. He's coming as an adult child to receive the inheritance before the father dies. Now, in, the, in, it, in Galatians 4 explains in great detail that under the law, a child... Um, is as a servant, uh, while they're still a young age, they're treated like a servant. They're put under a governor, a tutor and a governor, who tells them, another servant, who tells them what to do, when they can have to go to bed, where, restrict the area where they're allowed to go and play, and, and so forth. They're given orders and, and from the servant, even though that child, that heir, might be lord of all. Even though they may, might be a son of the inheritance one day and will be the boss of all the servants, at this point as a child, they're under tutors and governors and they, they're treated like a servant. When we trust the gospel, we immediately receive the inheritance. Um, as believers, we're immediately treated as in a sonship position, according to Romans chapter 8. We're joint heirs immediately because we receive that inheritance in Christ. Um, the, the point you know, that I was making there with the child, uh, with uh, the adoption in the Bible, is um, there's an inheritance that they're receiving, but unlike the inheritance we're familiar with, that when the parent dies, they get the inheritance, this, in the Bible sense, it could be at any age, when at the time appointed of the father, it says in Galatians 4, they receive this, they become a joint heir with the father. So adoption in the Bible has to do with inheritance. Hold your place here and go to Ephesians 2. Now, he says, to Israel pertaineth the adoption. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, look with me in verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh by hands, you know, what's the distinction in time past between Jew and Gentile? In time past, if you were a Gentile, you're down here on the, this little time chart that we have. It shows that after Abraham, God separated and, be, and created this nation through Abraham's seed, and then he gave Israel this preferred status or relationship with God. And after the Tower of Babel, the Gentiles were given up to walk in their own ways down here not in any covenant relationship or favor with God. In time past, the way you, when you read your Bible left of Paul's epistles, the way you know you're in time past is when a Gentile comes into the, into the um, context of the scriptures you're reading, that they're called uncircumcision in time past. Circumcision had to do with this, this sign given to Abraham of this covenant relationship God had made with Israel, promises, if you would, that he made with the patriarch Abraham that out in the one day Israel would inherit the land of Palestine as a eternal and everlasting inheritance. I say out here because Israel goes into it with Moses, goes into the promised land, but they're given the law covenant and they fail under that law covenant resulting in them being taken out of the land. But even when God gave the law to Moses, he told Israel one day I'm going to make a new covenant with you in which I'm going to put the law in your hearts and make you righteous. And that is through the redemptive work of the heir that God made promise to Abraham that he would give all this to Israel through. They would receive the inheritance through an heir that is able to satisfy the law. And they're able to receive the eternal life and promises God made with Abraham. 
Paul's saying to Israel pertaineth this hope of an inheritance, an eternal life. But, and that was their possession as a, they were to receive the inheritance in adoption before you became, before God revealed to you that you could be saved by trusting that Christ died to pay for your sins and receive as an inheritance eternal life. Our inheritance, again, is in the heavenly places. It's not a part of Israel. We don't receive Israel's inheritance that God promised to Abraham and that we'll inherit the land. You can read uh, Romans chapter 4, and it explains in detail, and the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians explains that the, the inheritance that we receive as the children of Abraham pertains to us receiving eternal life through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, by being identified together with him. That's the, the inheritance of eternal life that we receive. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, so Ephesians, we read verse 11. In time past, Gentiles were called uncircumcision by those which are, are called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. You see that? So there was a mark in the flesh that the children of Abraham had in circumcision and they knew themselves to be a peculiar and special people, class of people, and they were not to intermarry with the Gentiles in time past. They weren't to mingle with them. If they were, if they did, uh, if the Gentiles became their servants, they were to uh, become circumcised and be part of this uh, possession that God uh, had, had promised to, to Abraham. So. They were to become a Jew and so forth to receive any blessing through the nation of Israel as a channel of blessing in time past. Notice verse 12. Notice at that time when you were called uncircumcision by those which are called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands in time past. At that time, before God raised up the apostle Paul, at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Israel has this commonwealth. You see the commonwealth in the early part of the book of Acts when they sold all things and had all things in common. Israel was to have this possession of God, this inheritance that they shared in common. They were divided, different land inheritance in, in you know, specific parts of the land. It ends up they inherited as individual tribes, but they inherited it jointly as tribes and so forth. So there was this commonwealth. God blessed Israel as his channel blessing in time past. But in time past, if you were a Gentile, you were without Christ. You didn't have a hope of a Redeemer promised to you as a Gentile in time past. You were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from what? From the covenants of promise. What covenants of promise did Israel have? Well, in Galatians, you see that the promise was a reference to the Abrahamic covenant. It was an unconditional covenant. It was a promise that God made to Israel by inheritance. To Abraham and his seed, they were to inherit this land. How much of the land did Abraham's seed did, did he inherit in his physical lifetime? He didn't receive any of the promised land when Joshua and those went into it, except his heirs did. So Abraham was promised eternal life. He would receive it inheritance as an eternal or everlasting possession out here in the kingdom, when the Lord comes back after the tribulation and sets up that kingdom, Abraham's going to receive his share of the inheritance in that land that God promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as an everlasting possession. So there's two parts of that inheritance that, of promise, that covenant of promise. Again, in the verse uh, that to Israel, they, um, in time past, uh, as Gentiles, you were a stranger from the covenant of promise that, that God made with Israel, having as a Gentile no hope and without God in the world. Now, in this age, in, but now, in this dispensation of grace, the passage goes on to say, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, were made nigh by the blood of Christ. On our chart here, we show that God interrupted Israel's prophetic program around Acts chapter 7 with the stoning of Stephen and, and, and in Acts chapter 9 with Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus uh, being given, uh, the Lord appears to him and tells him that he's separated him for a work. He's to be Paul the apostle in Acts chapter 9. So what happens is God reconciled the world unto himself, 2 Corinthians 5, 
by reckoning the nation of Israel down among the Gentiles. That wasn't the Gentiles being given Israel's blessing and brought up here. That was Israel no longer having that status or position of being that, that privileged nation in the sight of God who was walking by covenant relationship with God, given favor and giving special blessing above the Gentiles. Now Israel, just like any other Gentile, is saved by grace through faith alone, trusting in the same gospel message, equally that Christ died to pay for their sins today, just like we need to. So they receive this. If, it, if a Jewish person trusts that Christ died for their sins, they're not given special status in the kingdom today. They're, they're going to receive the same blessings you and I are as members of the body of Christ. Now they have, <clears throat> as members of the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile are equal. We, are, we have the hope of ruling and reigning with Christ in the heavenly places. We're children of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's our inheritance. So today, so um, as far as, but now, God has changed the program. And so Paul in, in Romans chapter 9, again, is explaining that Israel in time past had these specific privileges with God. And they received the adoption and adoption. They were the children of the adoption before God changed programs and said that God had a secret purpose to give you and I an, an, an inheritance. That he would give us adoption. We're accepted. We're adopted unto God. We're accepted in the beloved one, in Christ. And because Christ has received the inheritance from the Father because of his faithful work at Calvary, we know in Hebrews 1, he's seated at the Father's right hand. He's, his, his throne is, he's given a throne now at the Father's right hand. It's a place and a position of inheritance that he has at, seated at the Father's right hand. And Ephesians 2 says, we're, in, we're seated in the heavenly places in Christ. That's why we have an inheritance, because we receive it through Christ. And that Israel, we know, will receive their inheritance because of what Christ accomplished for them at Calvary, of course, as well. And it was promised to them first, is what he's saying. To Israel pertaineth the adoption. Um, Charles Baker says about adoption that the word adoption means sonship. Okay, so there, the, you know, the, these gentlemen are both uh, dispensationalists, Schofield and Charles Baker. They understand, they're, they're saying that adoption isn't the same as it is in our reference and, and common day terms, becoming a child of the family. But it's a child of, of adoption has to do with a, a son who's already a child of the father receiving their inheritance. Um, adoption only appears five times in your Bible. And so when Paul says in Romans chapter 9, to them pertaineth the adoption, what would you normally do? Get your uh, concordance out, look at adoption in the Old Testament and see what he's talking about. You know how many verses you'll find if you do that? Zero. It only occurs five times in Paul's epistles, the word adoption. Now is that because Paul says it, but it didn't exist as a doctrine before Paul writes to the Romans? No. It just means that in Paul's, the Greek word that Paul spoke referring to this adoption, the Greek word was translated correctly, adoption, into our English, our English word adoption. And we understand the word, but the way you study it in the Old Testament, you know, sometimes people get fouled up. If I can't find adoption in the Old Testament, that means it didn't happen back there. Well, you have to understand what adoption is by studying your Bible, and you know it to be the inheritance. And you know it to be, he's, he's saying that Israel had this pri privileged position as a child of God in time past, you get this status as a saint of the Most High God, an adopted child of, of the Most High God now. But they had it first. God hasn't broken any of his promises to, to the nation of Israel that he made with them. And, uh, but uh, the, go with me to Romans 8, verse 15. Of the five times that it appears in, in Paul's epistles in our English Bible, the word adoption. Verse 15 says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The only one who cries, Abba, Father, in the Bible, other than us, in the Scriptures, is the Lord Jesus Christ, that he does that, Abba, Father. 
he, he cries to the Father in the garden and, uh, when he's praying in Gethsemane. Um, so we cry. We have that spirit of adoption. What is that spirit? We, are, we know that we're sons of God. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We have a sonship. We have the spirit of adoption. We are identified together with God's Spirit, with the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of adoption. We have that Holy Spirit of promise there. So it's interesting. You know, he says he's the Spirit of promise here and over there. Uh, I mean, Spirit of adoption in Romans 8, but over there in first, uh, or Ephesians 1.13, it's the Spirit of promise. This, so you, you understand this adoption has to do with this promise and it has to do with the inheritance and how is Israel going to receive it? They're going to receive it through the new covenant that God makes with them. They'll experience the possession of the land at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when they enter into their inheritance. That inheritance has two parts. It has a physical part, if you will, and a spiritual part. The eternal life in the land, that has to do with the spiritual thing. How many of the nation of Israel, when uh, Joshua led them into the promised land, jo Moses was cut off out of the promise. Why? Because he struck the rock when God commanded him just to speak to it, right? Okay, so Moses being cut off from his people, God took him, didn't let him go into, that means he went to hell, right? Well, that's what some people want to say being cut off means that God cuts you out of the inheritance so he wouldn't get eternal life or anything, right? We know that's not true. Moses, he wasn't sent to hell. He just wasn't allowed to walk into the physical promise in his lifetime. Now, he will be resurrected into it over here. We know that he's one of the ones when Christ was dis transfigured that was there, right? So we know he's, Moses is alive. He's doing well. He just had to be cut off physically. There's a being cut off physically in the nation of Israel that has to do with judgment for disobeying God's commandments, and it's a civil thing, and it has to do with obedience to the law. And, um, but um, look at verse 23 of Romans 8. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of Christ, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. The, the experiential side for us when, we're, when we receive that immortal glorified body and we have, no longer have a sin nature and we're placed as sons of God in our inheritance experientially out there at the, at the rapture, the catching away of the church, that's called the, the adoption, the redemption of our body. That's when we're placed physically in that inheritance out there. Uh, that's the second time it appears in Paul's epistles. Uh, if you go to, uh, you know, of course, Galatians chapter 4, verse 5. Go with me there if you're, um, we probably won't be going back to Romans. We'll just talk about Romans. Uh, Galatians 4, 5, it appears. Now, this is the, the explanation. I'll go ahead and read it. Quick review for us. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth noth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Who are we talking about? The heir. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. That's inheritance. That's when he receives the adoption. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law with the new covenant, that we might receive what? The adoption of sons. You see that? The heir, the adoption of sons. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, what? Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, what? Then an heir of God through Christ. So there's the, so that's the fourth time the word adoption appears. And the last time is Ephesians 1.5. Ephesians 1.5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God had a program to Israel pertaining to the adoption. Did, did God have a plan and did he predestinate the, the believing remnant 
would be his sons as part of the prophetic program. All those who walked in the faith of their father Abraham would receive an adoption, eternal life in the land forever. Yes, that's where I was going a moment ago. There's a physical side to this adoption of Israel. When Moses wasn't allowed to go in, but Joshua went in, how many of the seed of Abraham who were circumcised, how many of them received a, a chunk of land as part of the inheritance when they went into the land? All of them. All of them that made it, survived, weren't killed, whatever. They were all getting... Now, how many of those, all of, the, uh, all of those that went in with Joshua, how many of those will be resurrected to go into the, to the kingdom over here and receive this inheritance forever? And I'll say it wasn't all of them. There was a believing remnant within the ranks of Israel that will be resurrected and go into that inheritance. So there's an immediate physical part of this inheritance being of the seed of Abraham that was a blessing if you were a part of the nation that was called the nation of Israel in time past. You were blessed along with the believing remnant in that you received a lot of physical privileges, blessings, and, prom and promises from God. If you hearken unto my words and obey my words, then I'll bless you uh, among your enemies. I'll bless you in your harvest. I'll bless you with your childbearing. I'll bless you as a nation and all those things. But if you don't hearken unto my voice, then I'll curse you with your enemies. I'll curse you uh, with disease and, and famine. I'll curse you with barrenness of the womb and so forth. So under the law, that whole nation was dealt with. The barometer was whether or not they were walking in, in obedience to God. The only time you really see uh, them walking in obedience and favor before God is under David and under jo Solomon in time past. The rest of the time, they're being judged for their disobedience. So in time past, the adoption, there was a physical side and there was a eternal, I mean a spiritual side having to do with being resurrected into that inheritance uh, as part of their hope. Uh, being, Israel had the adoption in time past. Now as sons of God, as verse five says, having predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So a lot of people will look at that predestinated and they'll get confused with God foreordained before the foundation of the world, who would get saved and who wouldn't, you know, Calvinists. That's not the predestination God foreordaining individuals. What he foreordains is that all those who will trust in him and the gospel, various gospel messages throughout the Bible are receive salvation in his son and in Christ, they're predestinated unto some blessings. In the heavenly places, the mystery program that we read about in Romans through Philemon, our hope, and then the setting up of the, the kingdom hope, the, the prophetic hope in Israel's program all through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go to Galatians, now, um, verse 16 of chapter three, Galatians chapter three, verse 16, the Bible says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant, the law, that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 400 years and 30, 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the what? The promise of none, none effect. For, the, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave to Abraham how? By promise. So we have to understand that even though the covenant God made with Abraham, he, he gives him the sign of the covenant later on with circumcision, and you know we need to understand that this is an unconditional promise God made with Abraham. And the only way they're going to be able to inherit, inherit it in God's mind is through the righteousness God makes them in his son as their redeemer. They don't understand that back here. They just know they have a promise from God. And God, through time and, and through progressive revelation, through Paul, we understand how it is that God could be just to promise Israel an inheritance out there as an everlasting possession when they had a sin problem back here. Um, <clears throat> so, um, going back to Genesis chapter 17, we have run out of time this morning, so I'm going to uh, just say that we'll have to pick it up again here.